How was it? This was 1981. Now they had 600,000 people. The population had doubled since we were there. In 30 years, it doubled. And the two doctors were now... The two, there were two hospitals now, and there were 16 doctors. That's a growth rate of 7% per year in the number of doctors, at, as fast as you can grow. Yeah. Now, there were 11 Mozambicans and five foreigners. And the foreigners were all from middle-income countries. Uzbekistan, Congo, and Cuba. Middle- and low-income countries. No one from a rich country worked for a long period, and they worked for five-year contracts, doing a very good job, very well integrated. But up here, in the northern part, it was still 300,000 and two doctors. Can you see? The challenge in Africa is that the remote parts of the districts where you have poverty, there the population is growing, and there you get two doctors working. This day he was alone, Dr. Uh, José was alone there, just like me, with 300,000. So the poverty keep creeping. This, the development had to be fast in Africa to get away with this poverty. This is where we were. And this, remember the tragic picture with Janet Modlana at the funeral of her husband? This is Janet Modlana today. She invited us for a tea in the afternoon. Very, very good identity with Mozambique. No question. This is my country. I was born in the U.S. Eh? And I asked her, would it be different and more democratic had your husband lived? Mm, no, she said. It's so difficult to be president in an African country. There is no way I could think or say that my husband would have done it better than anyone else. That's just a rumor. It's so challenging. All the family are hanging on you. Your own ethnic group are demanding this and that. It's so challenging. I think we've done well. And then she said what I thought was very important. 30 years is not such a long time, she said. 30 years is not such a long time. From 1860 to 1890 in Sweden is not such a long time or from 1842 to 1872, primary school until 1872. They are doing quite well, Mozambique, like this. And this is when I told the joke about George Bush, you know. <laughs> so I'll finish to tell you the same joke, you know. She really liked it, you know. I say, George Bush, you know, he had a problem. 2008, you know, he, he, he got broke. Yeah? He crashed together with Lehman Brothers, the world economy. And he had to call on the world because he needed money. And his friends didn't have money, so he couldn't call G20. G7, he had to call G20, you know. And he was very nice, you know, to everyone. He phoned Lula and asked him to come. And the way they stand on this photo is how they lend money to U.S. You can understand the diplomacy in how they stand on this. And I think it's so nice to see how the positions are on this photo. You can see Africa is also represented there. But the ones who saved capitalism in the U.S. was a communist, a socialist, and two Muslims. <laughs> Lula... Lula lends $30 billion every year to the United States. Dilma continued to do so. It's the same amount of money as the entire U.S. aid budget. Fresh dollar on the table in Washington to cover their budget deficit. Because the U.S. has become a banana republic who can't keep them up. At the same time, Norway have the biggest recipient of aid is Brazil. And they gave $0.15 billion to Brazil every year. And I, I was invited by Stoltenberg to give a lecture, and I had a brilliant idea. So I said, why don't you cut the transaction cost and send the money directly to Washington? <laughs> we have to reform our way of thinking of the world. Huh? Remember this. Gapminder can help you. If Bush did it, all can do it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Hans, for this wonderful talk. Uh, I now invite uh, uh, Associate Professor, pa pa Professor Pamela Mbabasi uh, from uh, uh, Mbarara University of Science and Technology in Uganda and currently 
the Claude Aki chair at Uppsala University. And uh, she will give uh, comments to, to the speech and uh, raise questions, and then we will open up for the audience. Most welcome and a big hand. Thank you very much for that generous introduction. Let me begin by thanking Uppsala Africa Groups and Uppsala University for this opportunity and to express my appreciation to Professor Rosling for his exciting picture um, of Africa's progress. I think Professor Rosling's remarks and his previous work draw out profound questions. For my part, I approached this commentary with a steady eye on the title, Tread versus Aid. And I wondered what we have learned about aid that can inform us and inform our efforts to create more trade for Africa. More importantly, the whole trade versus aid debate that sets us up for discussing a problem that cannot be reduced to a simple answer. We know that aid is far from perfect and that to a large extent, it has not worked effectively. But is it truly possible to choose one over the other? I think the idea that tread should be preferred to aid does not seem like a fruitful way out, in my view. Yes, we need to increase tread, but that doesn't mean we should or can abandon aid. Instead, I want to argue that we should reposition aid as a form of investment for Africa. We should focus less on the general patterns, but instead determine under what condition aid has worked and what it means to have worked. And briefly, I would like to highlight some issues for our discussion. I think first, African countries face major structural challenges internally and externally. These challenges are so fundamental and commonsensical in a way that they force us to reconsider any simple answers to the trade versus aid debate. Indeed, for a country like mine, Uganda, I'm not sure trade alone will be enough. And, and bear with me, I'm, I'm coming round. Economic and social policies pursued by most African countries have been counterproductive and inimical to rapid economic growth, the money that you're talking about that we need to really, really um, produce. And several scholars like Schertz have argued, and quite convincingly, that our economic and social policies have been problematic. In many cases, the policies pursued by African governments in the areas of agriculture, industry, foreign exchange, and indeed population, have not been effective in the sense of bringing meaningful development. However, the international division of labor between the industrialized and the non-industrialized countries means that African countries participate in trade through exports of products in which they have advantages derived from nature rather than from the productive skills of their labor. I think African states are victims of their own specialization in primary production. Apart from the declining shares in world trade over time, the prices of primary products are very unstable, which implies uncertainties in the terms of revenue from exports. So how are we going to create this money? In addition, most primary products are now also being replaced by synthetic substitutes, which means that the demand for African products will continuously fall. Trade barriers or protectionism in the form of tariffs, quotas, and the non-tariff barriers have had a very devastating effect on African countries. And African countries, most importantly, need infrastructure development. My country, Uganda, has just discovered oil. But I'm not sure whether we will be able to manage it well if we don't really quickly work on the whole issue of infrastructure. Without infrastructure, roads, water, transport, air links, airports, railways, power generation, you name it. Any form of development will continue to stall. And there is strong evidence that without infrastructure development, other forms of economic progress are less likely to happen. Now, I'm highlighting all these issues to point to the challenges of trade for Africa. In addition, several scholars like Samira Amin have argued, and rightly so, that Africa's 
slow economic growth is in part a byproduct of the policies which have facilitated governmental corruption. And governmental corruption is not just crippling African societies, it's bleeding their potential. Bring aid into the picture and the situation has moved from bad to worse. I think more importantly, aid in the form of budget support has been particularly problematic. Supporting national budgets deepens donor dependency and makes our governments in Africa abscond from their primary duties. Budget support, in my view, makes it easier for African leaders to concentrate on meeting the expectations of Washington, Beijing, London, Paris, and indeed Stockholm, rather than the needs of our citizens. I think second, we need to understand what works and why it has worked. I think, Professor Rosling, your work with GapMind has produced very important empirical evidence, and I agree with you in most ways, the picture you're predicting. And you've shown us much about the general patterns. And I want to add to this general understanding by underscoring the role of case studies, the value of unraveling the causes and consequences of dynamics close to the ground. If you look at a country's, uh, one of Africa's, and I know I'll get some debate around this, but I think that looking at a country like Botswana, which stands out as a model country on the continent in as far as successful economic growth is concerned. Many lessons can be drawn here, and I know Botswana still has a lot of challenges, HIV and all this, but that they have the money, and they have developed it through, and are trying to address some of the social challenges that you pointed out. Now, although Botswana was very dependent solely on aid from Britain at independence, it has now been able to transform itself into a middle-income country with the discovery of diamonds at independence, after independence, Botswana was able to negotiate unique trade deals with DBS in South Africa, with, and, and, and it now, in the recently um, renegotiated um, trade agreement, the, the Botswana government owns over 60% of the diamond trade in that country. A classic case of real and trade negotiations that have benefited an African country derived from natural resource. Now, other countries like Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Angola, and other, and indeed, Uganda have failed to strike such deals. I think we need to study such relatively success stories much more and try to understand how other African countries can draw lessons to transform themselves. Thirdly, much as it's well known that the impact of aid on growth and development is very questionable, why is it that the rich countries still provide this aid? And many reasons have been given. For example, it's been argued that initiatives which would have a much more significant impact on poverty also have a higher cost to the donors. The cost of aid is not as high as we normally believe, ranging from between 0.1 to 0.2 of your GNI, especially for countries like US and Japan. And if you see this in comparison to, for instance, the cost of farming subsidies to your, to your domestic producers, so I think that the West continues to give aid, not because it works, but because it's easy. Aid is also a good investment, as well as seeking friends. Donors use aid to buy commercial benefits, either directly buying preferential treatment for companies based in donor countries, or influencing recipient countries' policies. And several scholars have argued how China's rapid growth and consequent need for vast amounts of raw materials is clearly behind its new interest in giving aid to Africa it has very quickly, over a short space of time, become one of Africa's largest donors. Aid also buys friends. In 1962, the US president, John Kennedy, asserted that, and I quote, aid is a method by which the US maintains a position of influence and control around the world. Really, I put it right at the top of the essential programs in protecting the security of the free world, end of quote. So clearly some donor countries or some donor choices, for that matter, about aid spending are not governed by an analysis of poverty in Africa, but rather want to use aid to influence the politics and economics of our countries. And many scholars have written about this. Of course, I'm aware that for the Nordic countries, it has been argued that aid is provided as a commitment to improving quality of life and liberty on a global level, and it's perhaps part of your inter internationalist values. So for me, I want to posit that Instead of abolishing aid or stopping aid, I think we should learn how to make it more useful, predictable for producing good developmental outcomes and ethically in line with the values of the people in Africa and in, of course in the donor countries. So best on those brief points, 
I want to ask you, Professor Rosling, and all of you here gathered today, I think you need to help us in Africa untangle these trends. On the one hand, the contradictions of aid policies, which ultimately may not lead to much, and two, the promotion of trade, which if advanced without concrete transformation of the structural impediments to investment, industrialization, communication, transportation, market access, and so forth, will be just another empty strategy. So how do we move trade from one good idea to a reality? How do we change aid from charity to investment? I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for these interesting comments. And you would like to react? Yeah, I, th I think what you said in the end is the thing. It's investment. It's invest it is humanitarian aid is another thing. A country is struck by an earthquake. It has flooding. It has war. People have to run away. Humanitarian aid is another thing. Huh? We all agree on that. You know? and, and some countries, neighboring African countries are doing great receiving a lot of refugees from neighboring countries. They need help for that. Take that apart. Take that apart. The rest have to be investments, I think. And I think foreign money is better to go for relatively good, steady, long-term investments. Vaccine is one very good example. Huh? Uh, schooling, you need the quality of the school. Can foreign money improve schooling? It's, it's a desperate need of better access to primary school in remote parts of rural Africa. Look at Mali. It has the lowest school rates of the entire Africa, northern Mali. You can, you can really see problem areas. It's very linked to, to literacy. You name railways and power generation. I love that. You know? Trains and, and, and uh, power stations. You know? Now aid want to give solar lamps. They want to give electricity so people can read in the, in, in the evening. Those are nice. But you can't sterilize a scissor for a cesarean section with solar energy. You know that? You cannot deliver sterile equipment with solar energy because you need a huge amount of batteries. Because in short term, you need large amount of energies to heat that equipment. So everyone who wants to run cesarean sections have to have a diesel generator. Eh? And you can't run a good mill on solar power for milling maize. Eh? You can't run a sawmill on, on that. I, I see the, the analysis of energy, the long-term plan for energy is not serious. It's a short-term so it's almost like, I have nothing against those little lamps. They are nice. I even have them my, whole, my own in, in the summer house, you know. And you can have it. They, they are nice, but they don't solve it. Railways and power reconstruction. Let me show you just one thing here more, which I didn't have. And it was, it, it's if we look at the population of, not the world, that focus on Uganda. In 1973, your country looked like this. You had about... 19, look, 64, you were like Sweden at the independence, 7 million. Today, you are, you are about 35 million. Eh? And so many young people below 14. And you are set to become at present 170 million. That's Russia in Uganda. You will be the size of Bangladesh. Isn't it a very good idea to finance contraceptives <laughs> for the 30% of women in Uganda who wants them? Eh? I'm not saying that anyone ever should be forced with a number of children. Not at all. This is purely a right when you ask for it. Otherwise, it will backlash. Because it does not, it, it's mostly on the family level that is of economic importance that you can plan the number of children. And, and Uganda is a very special demographic situation now. So wouldn't that be good to know? And then there is women's right is an important part of this. Huh? It's an important part of this. And, and then the government could run the health service. But the steady investments of, of vaccines, contraceptives, what needs for school, energy construction, the dam in the Nile, you need a dam, isn't it? True, and you don't get it because Prince Henry went rafting and stopped it. 
It was appalling. I was in Makerere University. The evening classes were closed because there was no energy, because Prince Henry had been rafting. That's a problem with monarchy, I told you. Huh? <laughs> And then the environmental groups say no dam, and you need the dam, and it's very nice the dam because it doesn't contribute to carbon dioxide emission. And, and I don't see that you get the, 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 can use the development aid for the rational long-term decisions you need. Eh? And I saw in one of your writings to Norway, you even said finance the staff in the, in the government service. It's not enough to demand that the government service plan so that contraceptive is there. You also need to have the planners that know how to run the Excel. They definitely don't know it at the development office at the embassy. So what sort of investment is it that you would see? Are they very contextualized, differing in each countries, or are there some general approach of investment which could be changed in several countries in Africa using the aid money? Thank you very much. We should, uh, we should, uh, uh, there is a possibility for a, a, a few questions. We have people with microphones somewhere. Where are you? Our Afri Africa grouper. We have two microphones somewhere. Yes, we have one question there. I was a question. Uh, the microphones. Because I think it's a no microphones. Can you? Of the long term investments. You have to plan to plan you. for 50 years ahead. Okay. Mitt namn är Magda Johannes och jag kommer från en internationell organisation som heter Uhuru Movement. Uhuru betyder frihet på Swahili och den här organisationen betonar vikten av att den afrikanska arbetarklassen ska ha makten av Afrikas resurser och ingen annan. Eh, idag så är det så att vi inte äger resurserna utan att det är imperialismen som äger resurserna. Eh, och vi har afrikanska presidenter som styrs av USA och Europa. Eh, och Europa, det är faktiskt så att Europa lever på en pedestal på Afrika och har gjort det i ungefär 500 år. Eh, det funkar inte. Funkar, ja. Eh, och världen är inte överbefolkad som du verkar vilja visa här. Utan det är så att ungefär 10 procent av jordens befolkning äger 90 procent av jordens resurser. Så är det någon som är för mycket så är det de här 10 procenten. Vänta, det går fort. Eh, och det är så att det finns inte etniska krig i Afrika utan alla krig är imperialistiska krig. Så att det enda sättet man kan lösa Afrikas problem det är genom att krossa imperialismen och inte ha små projekt lite här och där. Eh, och Okej, okay, nu räcker det. Nu, nu, nu får du avsluta din fråga för det är fler som vill ställa frågor. Okej, okay, vad jag vill komma fram till är att den här organisationen jag kommer ifrån har en liten gren som heter African People's Solidarity Committee. Vilket är en kommitté av vita människor som jobbar under vårt ledarskap. För de vet att, de, att det är bara Afrika som kan befria sig själv. För ni har en väldigt neokolonial syn på Afrika och det är väldigt patetiskt att sitta här. Man blir förminskad som afrikan kan jag säga det. Okej, okay, tack. Uh. Uh, har vi ytterligare en fråga? Vi tar några... Uh, sorry. Can we I, take can I answer directly because yes. it was quite a complex question. Yeah. I disagree with several of your facts. Europe has not lived for 500 years of Africa. Eh? Partly I disagree agree very much with it. During a pe historical period, this has been very right. But the dominance of US is clearly diminishing with the messy way they handle their economy. And the rising power of China and India is quite quite correct. Many of my African colleagues and, and, and friends I hear saying that now we are in a new situation in Africa. We are not entirely dependent on one part of the world. We have the choice to now negotiate contracts with different parts of the world. And that one imperialism, what you talked about, did exist and greatly exists still when it comes to military power. Eh? when it comes to military power, but when it, and yes, also in, in, in many economics power, but it is indeed changing in, in, in present. And I agree with you that the world is not overpopulated. I agree, but what I say is the fast growth of population is an enormous challenge. Is, uh, for the local community who should build the new schoolhouses. Okay, thank you. We can have another one question more. 
One more question? Okay, a very short one then. A very short one. Hello, uh, my name is Nestori. Um, no, I'm not a professor, I'm just uh, a local here. Um, my question is, um, uh, how complex is to change the status quo? Because we already know trade is important, and at the same time with trade re restrictions and tariffs, but not much is said how we can solve the problem. I mean, and the problem seems are from the West, where the tariffs are and trade restrictions. So I wanted to know how complex it is. Is it possible to be solved? Thank I you very much. Say, uh, on the trade, if I answer first, I would say the tariffs are a shame. The agricultural subsidies and the tariffs of the OECD countries is m way bigger than what is called development aid. And they are really hampering development, what it is. Another problem, which really uh, refers to what you say by international companies, how they behave, they don't pay tax where they should. If the government would have mining companies and other companies having paying the tax locally, and the estimates of the avoided tax is bigger than the aid also, you have the remittance of money of people working outside, which also is bi bigger than that. And that come together is a situation of great economic potential at present, which is just partly being used or being available. That would be my answer. What would you say? Thank you. I think I, I, that is the tragedy. I think that the, the, the tariffs and, and, and barriers that the West has imposed on African uh, goods, like I mentioned, is, is a challenge. And this, this is what needs to be um, uh, addressed. I think if, if the West really means what it's saying, that they would like to help African countries develop. I think that they need to act on, on that. But also on the part of Africa, we have something to do. I think the way we trade individually and sub-regionally, I think we need to increase integration and come together as a block. I think if Africa united, and I'm against political integration because I don't think that the challenges of the EU really show us much, but I think economic integration for trade is the way forward. If Africa can increasingly integrate and negotiate trade deals as a block, I think we can counteract this and move forward in terms of promoting trade. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Mini. Thank you. Uh, almost, yeah. So, uh, uh, we th thank so much uh, all of you for coming and I hand over the word to our co-organizer, Mini Novaki. Just a very big thank you for your contributions. This is a small gift from Globalen, which is a fair trade shop here in Uppsala. Thank you very much. And next time you give the lecture. I'll be happy to. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks.